Thank you, Seth, and uh, again, good morning. Good to have you all here. Our guest speaker this morning is a longtime friend of Believer's Chapel, but uh, some of you might benefit from at least a brief introduction. Dr. Walkie was, for many years, the head of the Old Testament Department at Dallas Theological Seminary, where some of us, like uh, Peter Lilback and Mike Black and I had the privilege of studying under him. Uh, during that time, he spoke often at Believer's Chapel. This is particularly in the 1970s, and uh, we have, if you go to the website, uh, uh, under the heading Sermons, you can find Dr. Walkie, and he did a number of psalms as he taught here. And then, I remember back in the early 70s, he did a midweek service on the Proverbs of excellent series there. He has taught at Westminster Theological Seminary and at Regent College in Vancouver, Canada. He is now officially retired from teaching in academia, but he's still very active. He uh, is on the translation committee, committee of the New International Version of the Bible and what I'd call a prolific writer. He's written a number of commentaries from Genesis to the Psalms and uh, a two-volume commentary on the Proverbs, and it has now been edited into a single volume. Uh, time will fail me if I recite all of the accomplishments of Dr. Walkie. So, Dr. Walkie, we're pleased to have you back with us after so many years, and we look forward to your ministry here. A text this morning is going to be Psalm 69, so I invite you to turn with me there, and... Uh, We'll read the psalm. It's a rather long psalm. But uh, it begins with, it's of David or by David. I'm reading from the New International Version. And uh, I will not have time to discuss variations we may find in the translation. I wish we had time for that. But um, I think we're going to be okay. Save me, O oh God. For the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths where there is no foothold. I've come into the deep waters. The floods engulf me. I'm worn out calling for help. My throat is parched. My eyes fail looking for my God. Those who hate me without reason outnumber the hairs of my head. Many are my enemies without cause, those who seek to destroy me. I'm forced to restore what I did not steal. You, God, know my folly. My guilt is not hidden from you. Lord, the Lord Almighty, may those who hope in you not be disgraced because of me. God of Israel, May those who seek you not be put to shame because of me. For I endure the scorn for your sake, and shame covers my face. I am a foreigner to my own family, a stranger to my own mother's children. The zeal for your house consumes me, and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. When I weep and fast, I must endure scorn. When I put a sackcloth, people make sport of me. Those who sit at the gate mock me. I'm the song of the drunkards. But I pray to you, Lord, in the time of your favor, in your great love, O oh God, answer me with your sure salvation. Rescue me from the mire. Do not let me sink. Deliver me from those who hate me from the deep waters. Do not let the flood waters engulf me, or the depths, have sw depths swallow me up, or the pit close its mouth over me. Answer me, Lord, out of the goodness of your love and your great mercy, turn to me. Do not hide your face from your servant. Answer me quickly, for I am in trouble. Come near and rescue me, deliver me because of my foes. You know how I am scorned, disgraced, and shamed. All my enemies are before you. Scorn has broken my heart and has left me helpless. I looked for sympathy, but there was none. 
for comforters, but found none. They put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. May the table set before them become a snare. May it become retribution and a trap. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. Pour out your wrath on them. Let your fierce anger overtake them. May their place be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in their tents. For they persecute those you wound and talk about the pain of those you hurt. Charge them with crime upon crime. Do not let them share in your salvation. May they be blotted out of the book of life and not be listed with the righteous. But as for me, afflicted and in pain, may your salvation, God, protect me. I will praise God's name in song and glorify him with the thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox, more than a bull with its horns and hooves. The poor will see and be glad. Those who seek God, may your hearts live. The Lord hears the needy and does not despise his captive people. Let the heaven and earth praise him, the seas and all that move in them. For God will save Zion and rebuild the cities of Judah. Then people will settle them and possess them. The children of his servants will inherit it, and those who love his name will dwell there. The word of the Lord that endures forever. What a joy to be back at Believer's Chapel. We pray that we may listen well, and I know of no congregation that listens better than believe the saints that believe his chapel. Uh, we just love, we, we sang that we might eat the living bread. And we love to have the word of God open and broken like the Lord's Supper, that we might feed upon it by faith with thanksgiving. It's wonderful. Thank you, Dan, for entrusting again to me this opportunity to minister the word. It's a sacred responsibility, and thank you, elders, as well. I'm presently writing a commentary on the entire Psalter, a concise commentary and I'm up to Psalm 90. And of the Psalms I've covered so far, I've decided this morning that we would allow God to speak to us through Psalm 69. I chose Psalm 69 because it's a Psalm that shows us how to respond to persecution. I think more so perhaps in Seattle than here. But the Ten Commandments are denigrated, disparaged, and despised almost. We live in a culture like that. When I grew up in public school, the Ten Commandments were assumed to be a moral authority for the nation. But that's no longer the case. The president of, uh, one of the executives, rather, of PBS suggested that we take children and send them to summer camps to re-educate them. Diametrically opposed to the Ten Commandments that children should honor their parents but he wants them to dishonor their heritage. And he will educate them. The audacity and arrogance of it. And he will re-educate them according to his thinking, not into what Christian parents think. Not only is our culture becoming more and more hostile to the Ten Commandments, the state is becoming more and more totalitarian and it's, a, it's a, a deadly, toxic combination of a secular world 
with a totalitarian state. It's a taking away of the freedom of speech and the freedom of religion. And that's the reality I see where we're going. I suspect that in a generation or two, the church may become an underground church because it will stand for the Ten Commandments. And they don't want to hear that. They want their own liberty, their own freedom. So David, from what I confirm, the psalm was in a situ similar situation. He wants to stand for the temple and all the temple stands for. And at the heart of the temple are the Ten Commandments. But David is being scoffed and scorned for taking a stand in this way. And so we can learn from the psalm how to respond to persecution. I know my granddaughter faces persecution in the, in the, in the public schools. How do we respond in our situation? So let's take a look at Psalm 69. And David is a model to us. He gives us instruction of how to cope and live in our society. It's a long psalm, and if we're going to feed upon it, I'd better break it apart a bit so we can bite, get it down to bite-sized pieces. It broadly divides into two parts. There's a prayer in verses 1 through 29, and then there's praise in chapter, verse 30 and following. Often in Scripture, beginning and ending, they have a repetition of refrain. Notice how it starts in verse 1. Save me, O God. And that's wrapped up in verse 29. He ends that section. And as for me, afflicted and in pain, may your salvation, God, protect me. And then the whole mood changes from prayer to praise. I will praise God's name in the song. It's a radical shift. So 1 through 29 is the prayer, and 30 through the end is, is praise. And furthermore, the prayer falls into two parts. Uh, in the first verses, 1 through 12, he laments and complains about his horrible situation. And then in verses 13 through 29, he pleads with God to deliver him from this horrible situation in which he finds himself. So you see how it begins, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths where there is no foothold. I've come into the deep waters and floods engulf me. Notice how that is picked up again in verse 13 in the second section. But I pray to you, Lord, in the time of your favor and your great love, answer me. Now rescue me from the mire. Do not let me sink. Deliver me from those who hate me from the deep waters. And so you can see that this prayer has two sections. The first section, 1 through 12, is the complaint about his whole situation. And then the second part of the prayer is a, is a plea that God will take him out of the situation. The focus of my sermon is going to be on the first part, the complaint, though I'm going to bring in the other parts as well as time allows me. The first part of his complaint really has two parts too, that in the first verses one through uh, five, he describes a situation and then in the next part, he, he shows why he is suffering, and there it's where he teaches us how to respond in persecution and in suffering. So that breaks it down into more bite-sized pieces. And uh, so let's look at the lament, and let's look at his situation and uh, his, his, his sorrow and his suffering. So he says, save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck, by which he means death is imminent. 
I know the tra old translations have soul here, but uh, what is coming up to your soul it doesn't make too much sense to me altogether. And the word nephesh uh, basically means neck, and it's often translated soul, but so I think it should be translated here. The waters have come up to my neck. In other words, death is uh, imminent. And the situation is such, he says, I cannot escape it. I sink into the miry depths, which is the persecution that's all around him, his enemies that are putting him to death. I've come into deep waters, the floods engulf me. I should say here that you can already see that David is a type of Christ. That Psalm 69 is quoted in the New Testament as a reference to Christ more than any other psalm except Psalm 22. So, for example, in verse 4 where it says, He hated me without reason. Jesus applies that to himself. They hated me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in the law. They hated me without reason. Or well, the famous verse, verse 9, the seal for your house consumes me. After Jesus cleansed the temple, then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. And Paul assumes that David is a type of Christ when he writes to the Romans and and he picks verse 9b. And he says, Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen upon me. And so we're really listening to our Lord's suffering as well. And he had this verse, this psalm on his lips as he's dying because he says that the last thing he says, I thirst. And that was to fulfill the scripture. And remember that they gave him sour wine to drink. And that's what we saw here. They gave me gall to eat and sour wine to, to drink. And then when Jesus says he saw all the scriptures fulfilled, including this psalm, he said, it is finished. I have finished the prophecy. So we're really listening to the sufferings of Christ as he's being put to death upon a cross for his zeal for God. And so David and our Lord become a model of living in a context where we're being put to death. And he can't escape it. And he says, I sink in miry depths where there is no foothold. I've come into the deep waters. That means the primordial waters before the creation, the chaotic waters, and it's utter chaos and darkness. And that's how he feels. It's the way we may feel when we're facing a terminal illness. And there's no hope. And we feel like just darkness. And the psalmist feels that. It's the way we feel when we're in a situation of financial loss. We can't stop it. We're losing more money than we're making. <laughs> uh, I may just stop here to give a word of testimony to the Lord uh, of his goodness and be an encouragement to you, whatever your situation. Uh, as you know, my wife uh, was afflicted with Alzheimer's. And toward the end of her life, I reluctantly had to commit her to adult, 24 7 adult family care. The expense for me was horrific. It was $7,500 a month, which I could ill afford. But I was glad to do it for my wife. Uh, one of the few things she enjoyed at the end of her life was taking car rides. So every day, we take a car ride for an hour or two. We could no longer carry on a conversation, so we had the radio on and radio music playing. And I so enjoyed her watching her tap her foot, clap her hands. I 
I, I was glad to spend the money because she was still enjoying life. And you can't buy that. In any case, and in fact, she had a broken hip. Doctors were not overly encouraging, but I was glad to spend the extra money to prolong her life. But I was going on to financially real fast. Lord took his daughter home after seven months, and the expense was, uh, total expense was 52500 which is a lot of money for me. I know for many of you, we multiply it by 10, and it might be more appropriate for you uh, to identify with it. But in any case, after she died, I sent in a death certificate to, to the British Columbia government. And uh, a month later, they wrote me back. And they said, uh, there's been a clerical error. Your wife should have been getting so much money that we hadn't sent her. And the amount was 68,000 Canadian, which was 52,500 American. No. Amazing grace. Be encouraged, my friends. God knows his children. Takes care of us. But our sufferings, with, as horrible as they are, with terminal diseases, is nothing compared to what David is doing. It's just, the comparison is not too great. Because David is suffering for the kingdom of God. And we suffer with terminal illness and financial loss. This is the fate of all humanity in general. And furthermore, David could have escaped it. He could have walked away from it. He's suffering because he won't back down. He won't join the enemy. And he could have escaped it. But his conscience would not allow it. And so he goes through this suffering. And then, to make matters worse, not only is he uh, in his inescapable death because he takes his stand, but he's been praying, and God doesn't answer it. And he says, I'm worn out, calling for help. My throat is parched, my eyes fail, looking for my God. And I'm reminded of Christ on the cross when he says, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? And Christ understands sometimes when the heavens are brass. And we knock on the door, and nobody opens the door. It's as though it's double bolted. And Christ understood that. He's been there with us. And not only is he suffering, and then he seems abandoned by God in his suffering. Whereas God is not there, his enemies are very much there. And he says in verse 4 that they are numerous. So he says, those who hate me and they do it without reason, outnumber the hairs of my head. And they're not only innumerable, but they're powerful. Many are my enemies without cause, those who seek to destroy me. So his enemies are innumerable, and they're powerful, and they're unjust. It's without reason. And he uses a proverb to make it clear how unjust the whole situation is. I am forced to restore what I did not steal. That's a proverb of injured justice. He's done no wrong. He hasn't violated them. He hasn't wronged people. It's just that he will stand. He will stand for the things of God. And they can't stand it. What harm did Jesus do? He did only good. What harm does the church do with the salt of the, with the light of the world as he was, the salt of the earth? The true church, the nominal church, I mean, Jesus' kingdom was going to always have good and bad fish. 
and the world concentrates on the bad fish. The kingdom of God was going to have wheat and tares, and the, the, the world magnifies the tares and will not hear the wheat. It's, it's a total distortion, and it's, it's injustice. That was David's lot, and that was Christ's lot. And we must be prepared for this reality of innumerable enemies, powerful and without reason, who want to destroy us. But he doesn't say, he, he, he adds here, that this is where the typologies are they're never exactly precise, and this is one where the Christ is so much greater than, than David. And David says, you, God, know my folly. My guilt is not hidden from you. I am not sinless, unlike Christ, who was sinless. Yes, I, I have sinned. But that's not the reason I'm suffering. He's suffering without reason. I admit I'm a sinner, but that's not why I'm suffering. And if we're persecuted, yes, we're sinners, but they, that may not be the reason we're suffering. It's without reason. And now we come to the second part where we kind of get an insight into why he is suffering and how he responds. Lord, the Lord of the, um, all the heavenly host. And he's concerned because he's part of a community. And he's the leader. And if he goes down to defeat, those who put their hope in him will be put to shame. Because the enemies would have prevailed over the people of God. And so he says, Lord, the Almighty, may those who hope in you not be disgraced because of me, God of Israel. May those who seek you not be put to shame because of me. If Christ is not risen, then he is put to shame. He's been defeated. Our hope is in vain. We played the part of fools. But God will hear him and be victorious. And then there are some who follow him, and now he says, For I do a scorn for your sake, shame covers my face. But most are against him, even his own family. I'm a foreigner, counted as a stranger outside the community, to my own family, a stranger to my own mother's children. There's no closer relationship than that. They are uterine brothers. They have the same father. They have the same mother. They have the same blood. And even his own family is rejecting him. And that's what happened to our Lord. John chapter 7, the brothers tease him. He says, well, if you're going to be public figure, then go down where they're really your enemies. Go down to Jerusalem. And there say, let them hear what you're really saying, that you're the the Son of God, and they're almost taunting him to go to the place of death itself. And then John adds, because they did not believe in him at that time. But now we come to our, our text, why he is suffering and how he responds. For zeal for your house consumes me, the insults of those who insult you fall on me. He's suffering because he is standing up for the temple. It may be good for us to just stop here for a moment and think about that temple. What did the temple represent? The temple was God's breachhead into the world. The temple represented his presence and his rule. You may recall that the tabernacle and the temple was modeled after it. There were three parts. There was a courtyard. And then there was the building itself, the holy place. And then there was the most holy place where God dwelt. The whole focus of the architecture was focusing on that most holy place. 
as you read the kings as it was built, the roof line of the holy place is higher than the roof line of the most holy place. It's coming down. The doors entering into the holy place are wider than the doors into the most holy place. And again, the focus. You step up into the temple. Everything is focusing on that most holy place. For that represents where God really is. In the, these, these designs were quite common in the ancient Near East, not unique. They also had holy places and most holy places. And in the most holy place, there would be an idol of their God. So for example, we may imagine, we, we find the images of Baal, that he was a storm god, and he's represented with a twisted spear and a club. And the twisted spear represented the lightning and the club represented the thunder. And in a mindset that's very difficult for our modern scientific minds to think, they thought through some kind of magical words of recitation of their myths and through ritual, they could manipulate the deity to do what they wanted, to give them the rain. But in the most holy place, in God's temple, there's no idols. There's a box, a chest. And what's in the chest? Two tablets. And what are on the tablets? The Ten Commandments. God wanted to be represented in the world by the Ten Commandments. That is, that is the representation of his rule. And that rule was to go into all the world. That was the point of it. And over the chest was that mercy seat with the blood that priest put there once a year to XBA put away the sins of the people because they fractured those Ten Commandments. I think you can see how all of that is a picture of, 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 of Christ. But at the heart of it, and this is what David is zealous for. That's what it's representing. He's zealous for the rule of God, the truths of God. And his world disparages it as ours does denigrates it, despises it, because they want to be free from God's rule, from God's rule. But David responds, he will not back down. In fact, he doubles down on it. And he's going to be zealous, and he develops his zeal. And he says, uh, verse, uh, verse 10, when I weep and fast, why is he weeping and fasting? He's grieved over the sins of this people who are despising the things of God. I weep and I fast, but I must endure scorn for taking the stand. When I put on sackcloth as though I'm at a funeral of what's going on here, people make sport of me. And then he says, it's universal because those who sit at the gate are the elders, the rulers, the, the, the leaders of society. Those who sit at the gate mock me, and I am the song of drunkards, which is a figure opposites to show the whole world is uh, rejecting him. But how is God present in the world today? It's in the church. And what does the church do? It bears witness to Christ. It bears witness that he embodied the Ten Commandments. There was no sin in him. And we bear witness to Christ and all he was. He's the very embodiment of perfection. We bear witness not only that he was sinless and perfect according to God's word, who alone can determine what is sin and, 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 and other, we also bear witness that he died for us. He's the atoning blood. 
that he expiated the sins of his elect, of his own people. We bear witness that he is resurrected from the dead. We're bearing witness to the Christ, his perfections, his atoning work. We bear witness to the resurrection that he prevailed. Rome did not have the last word. If Christ is not risen, then Rome won. And might is right. And God does not rule. But Christ is raised from the dead, the victor. And he ascended into heaven where he poured out a spirit on the church. And as Peter was so wonderfully showed us, started, he was alone on the cross. His own disciples scattered from him. But then came his spirit upon the primitive few that was left in the church. And his church has grown. Yes, there's been good and bad fish and a lot of bad fish, but there's a lot of good fish too. And his church is now on every continent. <laughs> when I was 84, I was ordained an Anglican priest. And uh, you know, you know where, I'm, where my certificate of, of priesthood comes from? Rwanda, Africa. And my certificate is in French. <laughs> God's kingdom is over the whole earth, as he said he would. He said, I will build my church. And here we are, persecuted, yes, but here we are. And he said, I'm coming, we bear witness that he's coming again. And he will judge the world. By what? By the Ten Commandments. And he has written, he's put us into a new covenant. What is the new covenant? He wrote the law on our hearts. What is the law? The law is quintessentially the Ten Commandments. I don't have to tell you to love the Ten Commandments. You love the Ten Commandments. But I have to encourage you to take a stand in a hostile world that is hostile to the Ten Commandments, that the zeal for your house will consume us, that has consumed our Lord. In fact, our Lord was so consumed on one occasion, was in a house, and it was so packed with people. <laughs> You couldn't lift your arms up to eat. Nobody, they couldn't eat. They couldn't drink. There were so many people. And his mother and his brothers heard about that. They said, he's out of his mind. He's too fanatical in what he's doing. And they came down to get him, to bring him home. So he'd come to his senses again, not be so radical. But he was radical. And he said, who is my mother? Who is my brother? Who are my sisters? It's those who hear my word. And... And they, and, and they do it. How do we respond in our day? We respond, we double down. We will not back down. We will be zealous for the things of God. And it may be expensive to do it. He does something else. He's not only zealous, but now we look at his, his, his prayer and he prays for God's deliverance. And he says, 13, notice why he, I pray to you, Lord, in the time of your favor, in your great love, O God, answer me with your sure salvation. He repeats in his 16, answer me, Lord, out of the goodness of your love. He prays that he will be delivered because he is confident in God's love for him. I think you know the great Hebrew word, chesed. It means that we have a covenant relationship with him. He elected us for a relationship with him. And he will be loyal to that relationship because that's his very heart. He cannot deny himself. The best illustration I know of this is when Jacob is dying and he, he's on his deathbed and he calls Joseph in. And he says to Joseph, Joseph, this is the chesed you will show me. This is the kindness you will show me, the love you will show me. That when I die, you will not bury me in Egypt to be identified with the Egyptians. But I'll go back to that tomb where my parents are. I'll be buried in the promised land. That's where my hope really is. 
He can't bury himself. He's totally dependent upon the one with whom he has a relationship, that he will help me. We cannot save ourselves, but we know the one who is in covenant with us, who elected us, and he will not abandon us. And then he prays not only for himself, but now we come to the more difficult part of his prayer. He prays that God will judge the enemy. And he says in uh, verse 22, may the table set before them become a snare, may become retribution and a trap. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. The prayer is morally right. In fact, the matter is, it is justice that he's asking for. And Paul cites this passage in, in, in Romans chapter 15. Um, Romans 11, 9 and 10. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear. Down to this very day. And David says, let that table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and retribution. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and bend their backs forever. Tragically, his prayer has been answered. It's a very tragic history. When Rome fell in 70 AD, Josephus tells us that over a million people were killed. And the blood ran so freely in the streets, it was used to quench the fire of the burning buildings. If you want to see God's vehemence and anger against sin, don't look to the black and fanciful lines of a Baxton or a Bunyan or a Milton. Look at history. It's a tragic, tragic history. Israel revolted again in 135 on the Bar Kokhba. This time, 550,000 were killed. Nazism was absolutely horrible, satanic. Six million killed. It's a tragic, tragic history. Says the psalmist, who knows the vehemence of your anger? But that is not how we pray. We pray differently. Jesus taught us to pray for our enemies, to love those who hate us. On the cross, he cried, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They were putting out the light of the world that would have given them eternal life, moral guidance. They were putting it out. They were taking the salt that would preserve the earth and they were casting it away. They don't know what they're doing. The people who are trying to kill the church, they don't know what they're doing. What wrong has the true church done? We're here to proclaiming love for God and love for neighbor for yourself and willing to die for one another. Why is it being persecuted if it's not satanic? It makes no sense whatsoever. And so we pray, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They're putting out the light of the church as the light of the world. We're proclaiming the love of God and the love of neighbor, but they, it's, it's all good. It's salvation. And the world wants to exterminate it. It's satanic. Throwing away the salt of the earth. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And he's not only responding with prayer for deliverance, and we would pray 
with prayer for those who persecute us because we are lambs before a lion and we do not retaliate as the world does. We retaliate with love. And that's how the church was built. And not only that, he concludes with praise. And he says at the end of it, I will praise God's name and song and glorify him with thanksgiving. He is so certain that God loves him and that God is just and that God will hear his prayer. He can break forth in songs of praise beforehand. How do we respond when persecuted? We respond with passion for the things of God. We do not back down. We will respond with zeal. And it may be extremely costly for us all. We respond with passion. We respond with prayer. Yes, we do pray for deliverance. We pray and we also pray for enemy. I put it into three P's. Passion, prayer, and praise. For God will triumph. It will not fail. And even in persecution, we can sing a song of praise to him. Praise to God. Be zealous, my soul, for God is on your side. Bear patiently the cross of peace, grief, or pain. Leave to your God to order and provide, who through all changes faithful will remain. Be zealous, my soul, your best, your heavenly friend, through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. Praise God. Father, seal your word to our hearts. In Christ's name, amen. I give the benedictory prayer now. Is that right, Dan? So, Father, we bless your name, and we pray that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be with us now and forevermore. Amen.